Hi, David Yout here again with another binary reversing video. Recently I got reacquainted with the Epic's game Silicon Warrior, which was released in 1984 for the Commodore 64. This was a port from the Atari 8-bit version, released a year earlier. I've had a lingering question about this game that I'm going to finally answer with some help from two impressive tools that I've only recently started playing with, and those are the Retro Debugger and 6502 Bench, which I'll be showing here in a bit. First, let me give you some quick background on Silicon Warrior, and what I think of as an unsolved 40-year-old game mystery. In the game, players teleport around on a 5x5 playfield. A player moving to a tile will change that tile's gray color to the player's color. If the player moves to a tile already assigned an opponent's color, that tile will return to gray. The player's goal is to get five tiles of their color in a row, and then protect them for a few seconds in order to win that round. Players can shoot at other players, reducing their energy, and players can also use shields to block others' attacks. If a player's energy gets too low, they're moved off the board to their power pyramid to recharge before they can resume play. The other game feature that can send a player to their power pyramid are the black holes. These make a tile briefly disappear. If a player moves to a missing tile, or is standing on a tile when the black hole makes it disappear, then they're sent to their power pyramid. And that's all there is to it. It's a pretty simple game as games go. Now for the mystery that's been nagging at me. The instruction manual says, Black holes will appear when you least expect them, but there is a pattern. The secret is multiples of three. But that is all the cyborgs will divulge. So I've spent time staring at the black hole patterns. They seem to behave differently with different game setups, but I don't see how to predict them exactly, and the multiples of three hint didn't help me. The instruction manual leans pretty heavily into the realm of flavor text, but this bit of verbiage struck me as a legit puzzle, maybe, that a clever player was expected to figure out. So, it's been 40 years, and I wanted to know if any player had ever seen the pattern. I googled around, but I couldn't find anybody in the retro community that has mentioned it or was interested in this at all. So, I did some reversing using Retro Debugger for dynamic analysis and 6502 Bench for static analysis, and I got to the bottom of all of this. And what I'm going to do in this video is retrace my steps, uh, give a gentle introduction to some very cool reversing tools in the process, and put the black hole pattern question to rest. We're going to start with the Retro Debugger, which is an emulator-based debugger for the Commodore 64, Atari 8-bit, such as the Atari 400 and 800, and NES software. It runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. I'll be using version, uh, let's see here, uh, 0.64.66. This has an embedded Vice 3.1 emulator in it. And we'll start with a quick tour of this program, uh, since it's likely that many of you still haven't tried it yet. It looks complicated, but I find the tool to be very intuitive. Uh, first things first, if you've just installed Retro Debugger, you're going to need to install some ROMs for it to work properly. I'll add some pop up text to this video to list what you need. Uh, one way to get the Commodore ROMs is to download the Vice emulator. You're going to need to copy, rename things, and move them into a folder that uh, Retro Debugger knows about, which you can find uh, here. Select the ROMs folder. And then after that, you can start exploring all of these different data tools that the program offers. Uh, you'll see a different set of tool windows when you first open Retro Debugger than what you see here. These are the ones I want to start with, and I've saved my layout here in a workspace so I can get back to it quickly. So let's get to know some of these tools. When you're first getting acquainted with a debugger, you can either bring in a program to look at or just study the Commodore's running basic and kernel, which you can see here by the flashing Commodore cursor. Uh, this C64 screen window is of course the Vice 3.1 emulator. Uh, so let's do a hard reset here. And that pinkish sweep that you see across uh, the memory views, that's the Commodore doing its memory check, which involves writing test values to RAM. I've got three different kinds of memory views open, and in these views, the red or pinkish hues indicate writes to memory. Uh, blue colors show reads to memory, and the whitish colors show where the program counter is. So let's have a look at zero page in memory. I'm here 
I'm just going to jump to zero page. There's three bytes from A0 to A2. This is storage uh, for the software Jiffy clock. And for some reason, it's in big Indian, meaning the largest values are coming first. That's kind of the opposite of what you normally see in 6502. A2 here has a reddish hue because it's being constantly written to. A1 is staying mostly blue because it's being continuously read from. But see that it changes to pink every time this overflows. So watch this tick to pink right now. If the emulation was slower, we'd see these colors decay over time since they're being accessed during the CIA um, housekeeping interrupt. Uh, I can show this by pausing with F10. This puts me into a single step mode. And I can press F10 repeatedly, and you can see over in the disassemblers that's stepping the code. And if I hold down F10, which I'll do, watch these colors here where my mouse is. If I hold down F10, you'll see these colors fade away. And that's because they weren't touched yet. Again, another interrupt hasn't happened yet. And F11 will just resume normal execution. So most of these tools in Retro Debugger will give you options when you right click them. Uh, so for instance, I can right click this guy and change the font size because they tend to start with uh, very small fonts much smaller than what you see currently configured here. Uh, most tools require you to go into the tool options to change it like I just showed. A few of them will change size when you resize the window, but most don't. One of the very useful features for Retro Debugger is the ability to go backwards in time to rewind execution to previous states. So let's see that happen. If I type in uh, this is all being recorded. I can then bring up a timeline like this, and I can use the scrubber to go back in time, like to here, and say this is a different outcome. We'll be doing more of rolling back execution with other tools uh, a bit later, but that's a very powerful feature. <clears throat> okay, here's some disassembly windows over here. You can see that the scroll position is tied to the emulator's program counter. You can toggle this behavior by pressing the space bar, so I'll do that for the disassembly two. And then you can position it wherever you want. The mouse wheel or up and down arrows will scroll. If you hold down the shift key at the same time, it'll step um, 256 instructions at a time for faster scrolling. And as you saw earlier, if I do uh, control G, I can uh, go to uh, whatever address I want like that. All these navigation commands, by the way, that I just showed the arrows, the shift, the control G works the exact same way in the memory view. One of the other things you can do in here is if I have a branch statement, like I see a branch here, if I click right, I'll go to that branch destination. If I click left, I'll go back to where that branch was from. Now it can be usefully, useful to um, dynamically modify program state when you're figuring out what code does. I'm not gonna be modifying any code or memory or register values when evaluating how these black holes work. Uh, but just know that many of these tools you see that display runtime values allow those values just to be directly edited. So for instance, in this dissembler ways you could be modifying state, if I press control J, that's gonna move the program counter to wherever my current cursor position is. And if I pressed enter, I can go into a code assembly mode and I can actually assemble new instructions there and then escape will get me back out of that code. So, we should load Silicon Warrior. Um, since I have the original floppy, I had started by trying to boot up a, C a G64 image of the copy protected disk. Uh, this worked just fine when I tried it in Vice, uh, the game would load, but I couldn't get it to work in Retro Debugger because it's not using Vice's real drive mode that handles copy protection. The Retro Debugger source is online and when I searched through the source, I didn't see a way to turn real drive mode on. Uh, but if it's possible, please leave a comment in the video. 
So I'm gonna use a cracked version of the game instead. So I'm gonna go open that now. And uh, take a look at these sweeps right here. There's a small blue sweep and a big red sweep. That means uh, that's the cracks um, screen's decompression routine doing its thing, right? And that makes sense because when you're decompressing, you expect a, a greater number of distinct locations to be ridden to than read from. We got some music on now. So let's take a quick peek at some of the uh, SID views. We don't need that to find the black holes, but they're kind of cool and we're here. So we can see uh, all the SID registers doing their things. We can see the piano keyboard visualization as well. And we can also see this cool tracker history. Uh, this converts the SID to distinct frame events as best it can. If I right click here, I can save all that to a file if I wanted to. I think it's up to you to convert that spreadsheet of events into MIDI events or whatever form you might want them converted to. Um, maybe I should add that to chiptune sec. I don't know. Uh, so, I don't want to listen to the music, so I'm going to press Control T to toggle the sound. This works if you have any window selected, except for the vice window. If you have that window selected, Control T is not going to work, which is kind of interesting. Let's go into a Vic view. I'm going to Vic Control. And here we can see the text screen is set to 1024, right? Hex 400, that's the default when you first turn on the commodore. So in the memory view here, I'm gonna go take a look at that text screen that's happening on this crack screen. I can say Control G and go there. And right off the bat, we can see we see this text scroll coming in, and we can see it um, stack up there. If the case is wrong, you can go and change uh, the case by right-clicking. There's lots of options there. And we also see there's a scroll in the bottom of the screen. So since that's touching screen memory, it must be at the bottom of screen memory. So let's scroll down and see if we can find that. And sure enough, there it is. There's that scroll as well. So that's pretty cool. I'm going to pause execution here. Again, that's F10. Where this becomes really powerful is that many of these tool visualizations listen to each other's selections. Uh, so for instance, if I double click this value here, the disassembler will jump to that value. But if I control click, I get something very cool. Let me, let me go up to zero page. So here's memory location one that controls banking. If I control click number one, it is going to show me the last instruction that has modified memory address one. And if I control shift click memory address one, that will take me to the last instruction in history that read that value. So that's pretty powerful, but it gets even more powerful. If I was to add an alt key to either of those key combinations, this will do the same thing, but it will also rewind emulation back in time to the most recent read or write, whichever you selected. So that's super useful anytime in your code where you wish you could go back in time to when the variable was messed with and just start from there and see what happened. So very, very cool. Okay. F11 to resume execution. Um, so let's get past this crack screen here. I'm going to press um, space. There we go. You see some more memory moves going on. And now here are the instructions. If I press space, I go between pages of instructions. Make this memory view a little bit bigger because there's something going on here. So you can see each time I press space, I'm reading from memory a different consecutive, um, wait, why isn't it working? There we go. See that blue bar over here in this section? It just, I'm gonna hold down space. It keeps reading different consecutive 
uh, sections of memory to get the text out. And every time it does, it's writing it to the same area up here, which is, of course, the screen. Um, so this memory map quite often is the fastest way to figure out the general neighborhood where code and data that you're interested in um, lives. So I thought that was pretty cool. Let's scrunch this guy back down. Okay, uh, I'm gonna press escape because that is mapped to the Commodore run stop key and that will take us to the Silicon Warrior title screen. Now we could create a snapshot here in case we wanted to skip all the crack stuff later. If so, you go to code and you'd say uh, save snapshot. Uh, note that when you restore from a snapshot, you're, you won't be able to go back in time prior to the snapshot's starting cycle. But you can save the current recorded timeline using the timeline tool if you want to, but I'm not gonna show that. Okay, so we're looking at game code now. Let me get this guy resynced. In the disassembler here, it looks like we're stuck in a tiny loop. So let's pause that and take a look. If I press F10, uh, yeah, so it's waiting for a memory location to change. Um, and this is something that tiny loop can't do itself is change that. So what we're really waiting on is a raster interrupt. And to see this, I'm gonna open up the, the VIC stuff. So C64, let's look at the VIC. Ooh, that's a little small. This is again, another case where we have to embiggen these things. Okay, that's good. Yeah, this toggles when you click up here. So you can see the second line says that the raster is, there is an interrupt enabled, a raster interrupt is enabled here and it's gonna be triggering on line FC. Why we're also in this Vic view, you can see that the title graphic text that's over here was done with sprites, not high res or redefined characters. Uh, so for instance, sprite number four here, if you're going down, that sprite's displayed in this column. Uh, it's the E and part of the P in epics. Okay, let's just move this aside. Uh, back to the interrupt. Um, in the disassembler, let's go to 0314. I guess we could do this in memory view also, but 0314. And we see that the vector here is 1400, because remember the byte order is little Indian. By default, this is EA31, of course, which is what's called by the kernel about once a GFT to do housekeeping tasks, but it's rede being redefined. So that's where we're gonna go to when we escape this uh, little loop. So yeah, it turns out being stuck in these tiny four instruction size loops and waiting for the interrupt is how this game spends the vast majority of its cycles, uh, both in the menus and in the gameplay. So let's go to that spot, Control G, 1400. And we're gonna toggle a breakpoint there. All I have to do is click the line and you can see now this breakpoint because the line is red. I'm gonna press F11 to resume. And uh, now I'm at that breakpoint, uh, which we can see because the program counter over here is um, at 1400. And you can see the current raster line is FC and the raster interrupt is FC. So we're free of that little loop now, which is good. Uh, there's code below this 1400, which you'll see is gray. For instance, that one's kind of dark gray. That one's kind of dark gray. That's because all the previous passes through this code aren't hitting those lines, or at least not yet. And that's a nice visual indication, indication of what the data flow looks like. On 14OA here, whoops, I didn't want to set a breakpoint. You can see it's inking, um, incrementing memory location 20 every time the interrupt hits. So let's look at that in the memory view. And here, go to, let's go to zero page and 20 is right here. I'll just go put my cursor below it. When I press F11, it takes us to the breakpoint on the next frame. So repeatedly pressing F11 is incrementing this value here. You can see that. 
Um, and having a frame incrementer is handy. This is a common programming pattern for making decisions based on frame numbers. If you want to change this value during program execution, you can just type in a new value as well if that helps you debug. For instance, I'm just going to type a zero. Now I've changed it. I can press F11 to continue, and it just goes on its merry way. Hopefully that hasn't messed up something else. I'm going to want to switch over to static analysis soon to try to solve this black hole mystery. So let's figure out what range of this memory we want to export from the retro debugger. I can make a guess empirically based on how I see memory being used, and that should be good enough to capture the black hole logic. We don't need to capture enough to reconstruct the complete game, just enough to answer the question. And I'll need to see memory being used uh, during gameplay to kind of get a feel of what's important. So let's get past this title screen here. Uh, I'm going to resume. Whoops, let's get rid of that breakpoint. Nope. There we go, we're off and running again. Uh, you might need to go to something in cases like this, to settings and jo say joystick and uh, choose the keyboard. I already have that turned on. Uh, when that's the case, you can use arrow keys for joystick movement and for the second joystick, which I'm gonna be using the alt right key as the fire button. So I'm gonna press that now. There we go. So we can use the up and down arrows to change the number of human players here. And um, as I'm switching between these, uh, I can see that in page zero here at location 40, that that is holding the value of human players that I'm selecting, which is kind of interesting. So uh, let's choose one player. And now I can select the number of computer players. And as I'm selecting between these, I can see the adjacent memory location 41 is also being modified. So let's make that three players. Let's continue to the next screen. Um, when I did this value here, I don't know if you saw that light up, uh, 3f, uh, that became the sum of these two numbers. So let's test that theory to see if that's the total number of players by going back in time a little bit here. I'm going to go and get my uh, timeline and let's scrub back. Whoops. And instead of three players, we'll make this one player. And I'm going to press fire button. And yeah, now it's two. So that kind of confirms our theory that that's the total number of players with humans and uh, AI. Uh, we kind of got lucky to discover that that was stored there. It just happened to be adjacent to things that we were already viewing. But in general, uh, static analysis is going to be a more useful way of making those kinds of discoveries. So we're in the game settings menu. And selecting something here is going to launch the game. Uh, when we're doing this reversing to figure out how black hole patterns work, so, of course, we can figure out what this multiple threes hint meant in the instructions. We want to look through as little code as possible when trying to answer a question like this. So it's good to go in with some kind of hypothesis about where to look. And in this case, some of the menu options, specifically 2, 4, and 6, are going to activate the black holes, which are otherwise off. Uh, selecting one of these options must, therefore, set a memory location that is checked for during gameplay to see if black hole processing should or shouldn't happen. So this menu is very likely going to show us that memory flag setting, and then that flag will help us narrow down where to look for black hole uh, logic. As I move through these um, menu choices, you can see in the memory map that some activity shifts between adjacent stores of memory here. Do you see that as I'm going across? Every time I click, it's just moving. Uh, we can see that better in the C64 memory plot uh, down here below. So um, we can zoom in, we can pan um, by holding down this, yeah, the mouse button, we can pan left and right. And uh, where is that activity? Is that where it is? Yeah. I think I see it there. Let me zoom in. Enlarge and enhance. Okay, so every time I'm going down a menu option, 
you can see a different section of memory getting activated here. Uh, the question is, is why? And it looks like it starts um, here around 37DEDF. Uh, the reason why I know that's 37 is because as I move this, look in the bottom right hand corner over here, uh, it shows what the memory location is and what the value is uh, when you move the crosshairs. And this y axis is the byte value. So um, a value of X, FF will be all the way at the very top and a value of zero will be at the bottom. So it's a pretty cool view. So we should be looking in the static evaluation around 37DF for this menu area. Okay, let's choose option six and start this game playing. There we go. I'm going to open up, let's pause this real quick. I'm going to open up the Vic editor. And let's see. Here's the Vic. So you can see sprite definitions for my character here. And where they live. Let's resume the game. Yeah, as I move around, it changes, of course. So like if I come all the way to the front of the screen, you can see, um, whoop, I'm in my penalty box. Let me get back to the front of the screen. There we go. 2140 is where this particular sprite uh, lives. That's way easier than figuring out where the text screen is so that you can find the sprite pointers at the end of the text screen and then multiply those by 64 and then add the bank offset. You know, that's all the pain. So, uh, and we can also see that double height has been turned on for this. So that's kind of super handy. You could also see this in the memory view. So what was that? 2140. So let me go there. Control G. 2410. Um, whoop, did I type that wrong? 2140. I'm less dexic. 2140. And yeah, and there's the character. You might have to move this to align it correctly. This this column over here is sprite aligned to show sprites. This data column over here is uh, character graphic aligned to show like redefined characters. Okay, so let's figure out what bytes we need to export over to 6502 bench. And I'm gonna use this activity view to do this here. Let's resume the game. Zooming out. Okay. So you can see there's activity from zero to about uh, 4,000 here. And from about 4,000 to 7,500-ish, maybe. Yeah. Uh, these are all small 7-bit values. I mean, if it was FF, it would reach all the way to the top. And that's just too small to be code or graphics. That's probably just some kind of junk. And um, this section here is just all uniform. So that's not interesting either. So by the time we get up to where we see more activity, that's really in just the IO range and the kernel range. And clearly if that was custom code, we would be interested. One way we can know is to look at the CPU window. We looked at this a little bit earlier when we were looking at the program counter. Most of this should be familiar, right? You have program counter, you have uh, registers, you have flags. You can change these values for whatever reason. Like if you want to explore a different branch destination, you could change the carry flag. Or if you want to skip to the end of some X index loop, you could just change the X register, whatever you want. These are the X and Y raster positions. This is the C current CPU cycle, the current fixed cycle. Um, this EG shows the X ROM and game lines, which matter for banking if you have a cartridge in. Uh, but the one we care about is this O1 right here. That is memory location one, the, which controls the banking. And the default is hex 37. When you first boot up, that means you have the basic of the IO and the kernel are all banked in. But this is 36, which means the basic is swapped out, but the IO and kernel are still there. 
And since they're still there, uh, I think we could ignore all that activity that we're looking at in those areas, and we don't need to export any of that. So in that case, all we're going to be exporting is from zero to about, oh, let me show the activity again, the game finished. There we go, game on. Okay, it's just from here to about there. So that's what we'll be exporting. So to do this, I'm going to pause here and let's go here and open the console monitor. Ooh, that's small. Okay. And I'm just going to say save zero 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 two three FFF. And we'll call it black hole dot bin, something like that. Okay, and that saved it. Now it's time to switch over to 6502 Bench. 6502 Bench is a Windows only application, and as you can see, I'm running version 186 dev 1. It's a framework for 6502 tools, but I believe the only application implemented for it so far is SourceGen, which is a tool for creating commented and structured disassemblies. I'll likely be using the terms 6502 Bench and SourceGen interchangeably. SourceGen has varying levels of system specific support for the Commodore 64 and 128, the Apple II, the Atari 8 bit, NES, and even the ORC. And unlike some other tools I've used, projects made in SourceGen are designed to be reassembled. So let's start a project. I'm going to bring in that export. And the project file will be automatically named the name of the input data uh, with .dis65 appended to it. So we're going to end up with black hole um, .bin .dis65. That's how SourceGen keeps the project linked with the source data we dumped from RetroDebugger. Had we created the dump as a PRG instead, the first two bytes of the file would be the starting address. But since it's a bin file, 6502 bench is going to give it the default starting address of 1000. As you can see here, uh, this is not what we want. We dumped memory starting at 0, not 1000. Um, you can see we have address here and we have file offset there. Those should be the same in our case. But we can fix this. So I'm going to map all but the last couple of bytes and remap these um, in memory. So let's take these. And I'm going to right click and say create and edit address region. I'm just going to set that to zero. And now, if we look here at the top, the address matches the offset for everything but these last few ones that I didn't select. You can see that they still get to have a different range that's a hex 1000 greater. Making new address ranges is a great feature, as memory range copies are very common when uh, an 8-bit game is setting itself up, and you can line these up properly in this tool using the same approach. Had we not been starting with a live snapshot, there would have certainly been memory moves that we would have had to have dealt with. Now you saw in the retro debugger that the IRQ handler code started at 1400, so let's go there. Uh, coincidentally, this is the same key combination to go there as in Retro Debugger. It's Control G. So I'm going to go to hex uh, 1400. Okay. Now SourceGen treats bytes as data until they're explicitly identified as code or junk. And you can see that at the percents here down below. We have 0% code so far. Everything is just thought to be data. So let's disassemble from this point because we know there's code there. We saw it before. So I'm going to say um, tag address as code start point. And there we go. And you can see the percents at the bottom have changed. It's now 38.6% code so far. And you'll notice code above this section also got disassembled. And that's because there were some references to that above area from the 1400 code block below. 6502 Bench will follow references and disassemble from a given starting point for as long as it thinks it makes sense to interpret what it finds as code. 
and it uses some light instruction emulation to help with this. For instance, it can determine when a conditional branch will behave like an unconditional jump, and it won't automatically interpret the bytes along the unavailable data flow path. And it could do this because of these flag states here to the left of the instructions, which is the state prior to the instruction being executed. We can double click that, and you can override these if you want, but I've personally never found a need to do that yet. Um, so at 14.0a, uh, that is the same inc 20 instruction that we played with in the debugger. That's that frame incrementer. Source gen auto assigned it a label of L0020, uh, but let's make that label more meaningful. I'm going to double click the operand. Oh, this is an operand, that's an operator, right? So I'm going to double click the operand and say create label. I'm going to call this frame incrementer. Okay, now notice the indirect jump um, above is using frame incrementer plus two now. This is because uh, 6502 Bench has this seek nearby targets option, which is turned on for this project. Uh, this is kind of misleading here, just because this you know address is close in memory to the frame incrementer doesn't mean it has anything to do with it. The frame incrementer is only one byte long. It's not part of any larger structure. However, this is frequently the kind of disassembler guessing that I want. So I'm just going to uh, clean up this um, bad guess here with a placeholder label. Let's call it um, make it unknown vector. There we go. I don't know what this vector is, but I'll frequently create labels for stuff I don't understand yet, just to see more clearly its patterns of use as I go along encountering this label in other code contexts. Now you remember we figured out a few zero page variables in the retro debugger. So let's label those. Those were all up in zero page. So we had total players that was at 3F. So 3F here, we're going to label that um, total players. And this was number of humans, and this was number of AIs. And as we make symbols, we can navigate to them quickly in the symbols panel over here. You just double click them. We can toggle the visibility of address type symbols if we didn't want to see them by clicking that button as well. So this label naming approach worked because the addresses were all within the range of our binary we imported. When addresses we want to label falls outside of our code range, we can still create a symbol for it. And we do that by going to edit, project properties, and project symbols. And we can say new symbol and you know give it a name, give it its address and how many bytes wide it is, maybe it's a 16 byte value, maybe it's a larger array, or we could define a constant as well, uh, but we don't need to do that yet. But while we're here, let's go into symbol files. I'm going to get rid of this here, and let's add the IO symbols. So I'm going to add symbols from runtime, and in Commodore, through the IO symbols, there we go, and I'm going to apply that that's like getting a bunch of uh, code documentation for free. So if we now go to the top of our program, we see all these symbols now from our IO stuff, you know, sprites and uh, SID voices. These are not all of the IO symbols that are in that file. These are just the ones that 6502 Bench has already seen referenced in the disassembly that we have created so far. So that's going to help us identify code as we go along. Now you remember in the retro debugger, we saw that hex 37DF is approximately where the game menu sits in memory. And the game menu code should show us how the black hole setting is getting turned on, and then we can follow that path to where the black hole logic lives. So let's go to that menu. Again, Control G. 
Okay. So I see a compare one here, and here is a compare with two. Here's a compare with three, four, five, and six. There's no seven there, but that's probably the else clause. So this is clearly an if else cascade pattern. So I'm going to rename some of these, and that makes sense because there's that matches the number of menu items, right? So let's rename these here. Um, we'll call this if one. I'm just going to go down the row and do this. Make this a little easier to read. Else seven. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And let's come back to the top of here and call this the. Uh, Let's not make a label, let's make a comment because we haven't done that really yet here. Start of menu options. There we go. And let's make a long comment on this line that allows us to uh, have a multi-line comment. I'm gonna say menu options uh, one. Okay, um, I probably have some more typos, but who cares? Okay, those are our menu options. So when looking at each menu handler, there is a color RAM you see here, plus some X value register offset storage going on, and that's <clears throat> what's cycling the cursor color next to the menu item when you select a menu item, if you remember what that looks like. And that's why we were seeing activity in here before uh, for each different menu option. And each menu option sets one of three values as well, this B8, this B9, and this BA. Notice you see that on all of these. And that makes sense because we need to be able to turn on black holes, lasers, and shields. We just have to figure out which one is which. So in game option one, it has all three off. So we can see on this line here, it loads the accumulator with FF and puts it in all three. So FF must mean off. And game six has everything on. So if we go down to game six, we see it loading with zero and storing it into all three. So zero must mean on. Now, if we look at game two, that's just black holes only. So it loads the on value and stores it in B8. So that must be the black holes flag because that's the only one being turned on. Otherwise, it decrements and wraps back around to FF and puts the off value in the other two. So we now know where the black hole flag is. Let's label this. Create label. And there's our black hole flag. So we got these black hole flag plus one and flag plus two stuff going on again. I've changed my mind. I'm gonna go in and turn off nearby targets. So edit project properties, seek nearby targets. I am turning off. That looks better. I, I normally want those on, but not for this exercise. Okay, so option three only has the layer fire turned on. Uh, that means that B9 here must be lasers. So let's rename that to lasers flag. And by process of elimination, that means the BA must be the shields flag.
Now, these menu options are starting to look much more readable. And there's easy ways to navigate around all these new labels that we're making. Most times, if you want to go to an address, uh, say this new black hole flag, you just double click the instruction in front of it. And now we're here where that's defined. We make this wider. Uh, and if we want to go back, we can just click this navigate backwards arrow option after we're done working in that space. Okay, uh, so so far we've been creating symbols and it's been working just fine, but frequently you're going to want source gen to make use of symbols that are already defined, but for whatever reason, they're not being used yet in the way that you'd like. Uh, this happens often enough that it's worth going on a little side quest here to demonstrate that. So let me find some appropriate code, which I know where it is. Okay. Here's some code that doesn't matter to us except for this illustration. You can see that uh, a lot of the IO labels that we imported are already coming into play, making the code much more readable. And down here we have memory location 318 and 319 in hex. That's the address that the routine will be at that gets called when a non maskable interrupt occurs, such as when you press the restore key. Uh, there's a standard label for this, but we didn't import it. So this is a good opportunity to create a few labels and then show how to manually apply them when we need to. So I'm going to double click this and create a label the way we've been doing it. Unmaskable interrupt vector. Um, and here, this is this would have said NMINV plus one automatically, but we turned that option off. So let's set that now. And I'm going to use this symbol. This is what we use when we have symbols already defined. I'm going to say I want to use the uh, symbol we just used. And there you can see we have the plus one. This is loading in a 16-bit address into this vector. It's 1053, which we can see is up here. So let's give this a label and call this the NMI entry. Um, and now we want those high and low bytes of that to go into here. So the way we can do that is to come here, select that symbol we just made, and then go here and select that same symbol, but this time choose high. And when we do that, we can see that we get that less than syntax. Oh, I did this wrong. Um, it was these two values. Okay, that looks better. Sorry about that. And you get these uh, less than and greater than symbols that most assemblers use when specifying lower high bytes of 16-bit addresses. Okay, uh, sorry about that mistake. There we go, side quest complete. If this was like Witcher 3, you'd be going, whoa. Okay, so let's return our attention back to the black hole flag. We can navigate to this by double clicking on our symbol that's up here in the symbols pane. And since we're sitting on that location, we're able to see all the cross references to it here at the upper left. And there's a number of writes due to menu options that set this feature on or off, as you can see. However, there's only one place that reads the value. So that's where we'd be looking for the black hole logic. It's like it wants to be found. So let's double click that cross reference to go there. So the code here loads the black hole flag and it's going to branch if it's positive. Uh, that is consistent with zero being on and FF being off that we saw earlier. So let's rename this destination to black hole logic. And if this branch wasn't taken, it's going to do this jump. So let's guess on this and just call this guess end of black hole logic. Because we're guessing it's just skipping all of it if it's not turned on. <clears throat> so let's scroll down and see. Uh, yes, there's the end of the black hole logic. So if we click this and scroll up, we'll see all the highlighted 
instant uh, references to that. So yeah, there's lots of different ways to skip to the end of this code block. So that's probably a pretty good guess. And that's only about 50 lines or so that we might need to take a look at. So starting from the top um, here, let's take this first address, AE, um, and just call it unknown one. If we double click the operator in front of that, remember we can go to it and see the cross references. So there's three that are in this black hole section, but there's also a right to it that's outside of the section. Uh, let's take a look at that. Okay, so accumulator is getting stored in here. Where is that accumulator set? Um, there, it's getting set there. And so that's FF again, which what programmer Mr. John W.S. Marvin liked to use to show when something is off. So he's setting a bunch of code off here, which means this is just an initialization section of code, and we could ignore that. So let's use this handy navigate backwards arrow a couple times and get back to where we were. Okay, so we have a load and we have a decrement. And where's that third reference? Control F. Um, we can just search for it. Uh, there it is. We're storing a value into there. We're storing the highest seven bit value possible. So this is a decrementing counter. Um, and so let's rename this from unknown to black hole countdown because it's only used in the black hole section and it's a countdown. Okay, so heading back up, uh, we loaded it. So after decrementing, we have a branch here that will exit to this end of logic if the countdown is not still going. So I'm gonna just give that a comment and say, uh, exit if countdown is still going. And a good hypothesis at this point is that, that this is the duration of the black hole, since only one black hole can exist at a time. And if the one you have is currently running and hasn't finished yet, there's probably nothing left to do and you just exit. So that makes sense. And if that's the case, these five lines underneath here would be the logic to turn off the existing black hole. So let's look at these five lines. We're getting a value from the into the accumulator, we're getting a Y value. And then we're gonna use that Y value as an offset into some data structure that lives in zero page. Uh, and then we call, at some point here, this, we call this unknown structure. Let's rename that to unknown function. Okay, let's go pay a visit to that function, look at the cross references. So it's called seven times. Uh, it's in the black hole section twice. This is likely some manipulation of the tile itself since it's used a bit outside of the black hole logic. So we'll just keep that in mind. And if that's true, that means this Y offset into the structure could be a tile number referencing one of the 25 tiles where a black hole could happen on. And if so, since we're trying to turn it off, this B0 could be the current black hole tile. That's, that's a bunch of guesses. I'm not going to label that yet because the guesses have piled high now. So what we should do is we should head back into Retro Debugger and see if these guesses are correct while we watch some gameplay. We can watch memory. I like to bounce between static and dynamic analysis. For me, that really speeds things up when trying to figure out code. So we're going to set up a zero player game. This is something that Silicon Warrior allows for some reason. And turn on black holes. So zero players, zero computer players, black holes on. And now the black holes have started. I'm going to speed this up so we can see more black holes happening. There we go. That's four times the speed. So there they go. Now we had hypothesized that the black hole tile number was in hex B0 in static analysis. So let's take a look at that. Uh, when a black hole happens, I'm going to pause. So let's pause on that one and come over here and look at B0. 
Uh, that is 12. So that's 16 plus 2. That's 18. Okay, let's look. That might be tile number 18. Let's look at another one. And uh, that one is 4. So it looks like we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So I think we got this figured out. Here's what that tile numbering looks like. Now let's look at hex AE. That was our identified black hole countdown. Now we zoom here. So when there's no black hole activity, let's see what that looks like. AE. Okay. Uh, it looks like it's FF when there's no black hole. Let me get the speed back down to where we want it so we can see that better. 100%. This is clearly the duration timer. We could see it counting down when there's a black hole, and it underflows to FF, which turns it off. Uh, so that's exactly what that is. Okay, so now let's put a breakpoint at 1D, 1A. I'm going to put a breakpoint there. And that should hit when the black hole stops. Yes, that did. Let's step through some of this code. It's going to grab the accumulator, that's 0F, and it's going to grab a Y value, which is the tile number. <clears throat> so that got OE, so OE is uh, 14, so 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, yep, that lines up just fine. And then we see that it stores it in 0, 4, 6, which we think is likely an array of tile states. So let's go there and look at that. That starts there. Um, we can see all of these are 0, F. Uh, but let's go back a step in time and see what it was before we restored that tile state. And we can do that by pressing Alt F10. So I'm going to press that. And when we did that, we can see this tile changed to zero. Let's step forward again. And now it's back to zero F. So it was zero when it was a black hole. And zero F is the restored state that it was before. Alt F10 wasn't working for me uh, when I first tried this because my NVIDIA shadow capture was capturing that keystroke. If you have other apps that are grabbing these key combinations, you can always access this instead by going up here and clicking back step. So stepping again with F10, uh, we got that uh, store in 12. We don't know what that is. Uh, we don't care. And then we have a jump to a subroutine. We really don't want to step through all the instructions in that subroutine, but fortunately we can step over it by pressing, holding down control and pressing F10. So that was a step over. Did that step over? Is that key combination being captured? I think it is. Let's do step over. Well, for some reason, it doesn't want to step over that. I don't know why it normally works. That's not a problem. We'll just put a breakpoint here instead and continue until we hit it. Boom, now we stepped over it. There's always more than one way to do things, right? So the black hole was removed. So why do we still see this missing tile here on the game screen? Well, if you go to the viewfinder here, we could see the crosshairs show that we're up here. That's where the raster beam is currently located. It hasn't had time yet to draw the graphic change. And remember, you can always just kind of look down here as well and see the, the X and Y coordinates broken out in there as well. You don't have to use the viewfinder. So back to 6502 bench. Let's lock in our guesses that we just confirmed to be correct from active analysis. So AF. Is going to be saved tile state and B0. The current black hole location. Okay, and let's go to that structure. This is the tile state, so let's define that. It was 25 long. 
We get a count in the info section in the bottom right hand corner when we highlight it. I'm going to right click and choose edit address region and give this a pre-label, call this tile state array. That's a label before the first address in this group. And if I go back, uh, huh, I would have expected that to have automatically been labeled. So let's fix that. Get this symbol, call it tile state array. Okay, that's what we want. Let's go forward to where we were. Now I'm gonna highlight these bytes and collapse them like this. Densely packed bytes. So for me, collapsing byte ranges can reduce my cognitive burden when I'm reading my disassembly, so I like to do it. You can mark sections of memory as junk or a byte fill as well when collapsing them, and that will show up again in this percent section down below. I also collapse high-risk screens, character sets, and sprites, which SourceGen has special handling for. For example, remember when we saw my warrior sprite when it was on the closest tile row in the playfield? We saw that its graphic definition was stored at 2140, the address I had accidentally typed in as 2410. Well, we're going to annotate those 64 bytes of the sprite. And yes, I know it's technically 63 bytes, but it's 64 byte aligned. So let's go to 2140. 2140, not 2410. And identify that. Uh, the problem is that starting address has been automatically part of this fill area. It's made a fill of zeros for us. So we're going to undo that by saying toggle single byte format. There we go. And now let's get 64 in a row. Oh, we need to start from 2140, sorry. 2140. And now we're gonna get 64 in a row. Oh, we hit another fill area we have to undo. Okay, toggle single byte. Okay, sorry, this is worth it, hold on. 2140. Okay, 64 in a row. And I'm going to right click and say densely packed bytes again. And then for this range, I'm going to right click and say create edit visualization set. So we're going to say new visualization, and it knows there's a bright sitting there. Let's call this player front row facing right. Our sprite actually is multicolor. Uh, and it was cyan. So let's change that to three and fix the other colors here just because it's kind of fun. Remember that was um, double height. So we'll put that on as well. That's okay. And yeah, uh, any graphics you interpret in this way will stay in line with your code. Uh, that's pretty cool, huh? Okay, we're done with that side quest. I won't make another Witcher 3 noise this time. Let's go back to the black hole logic. So, G, 1D, 1, 2. So when a black hole appears, it has to update the tile state, and it's clear from the gameplay that it has to check and see if any player is standing on it, and if so, to send that player to the penalty box for a while. We're not interested in any of that supporting code. What we want to focus on is what the black hole pattern is, uh, when and where it's going to appear. Remember, this is something that the instructions insinuated. We might be able to figure out whether multiples of three, hint. So let's start by renaming this label here to new black hole. Uh, since anything past this code up here must be involved in the creation of a new black hole, because we've seen how a black hole goes away. Now, something that stands out is these three jump to subroutines in a row. They're going to the same subroutine. That might be the multiples of three they're talking about. Uh, so that's our next stop. Let's look at that. Okay, this is just nine lines. Uh, it starts by doing some 
icky uh, 8-bit manipulations uh, to the byte stored in memory location hex 21, then it is going to take that value and XOR it with the frame incrementer. That incrementer is going to have a uniform distribution over time, so this is acting like a whitener, if you're familiar with that computer security term. And then it returns that um, widened value in the accumulator. So clearly, this is a pseudo random number function that updates its random state and returns a, rand a pseudo random value. So let's add some comments to this. I'm going to call this pseudo random number state. This is where the state is updated. Whoops, I don't want to put it there, I want it as a comment. This is widen and return. And let's give this function a name, pseudo random number generator update and return because it updates the state and returns a number based on that. So for small confusing bits of code such as this, I'll often switch over to Python to see how they behave. Okay, here's my conversion. In the comments on the right, you can see the original assembly and on the left, you see the equivalent Python. While writing the Python, I validate this code against the generated values in retro debugger, but I'm not going to show any of that bit of tedium. Notice that before the SBC, uh, the carry flag is not forced high, but rather it takes on its value from the previous right shift. In a similar way, the right shift carry result is also used in the rotate right instruction that's below that, which is the only place where the state gets updated. Here's how the random state changes when it's updated. It always follows this pattern. It's going to visit all the values from 0 to 255 in this order that's shown, except that it skips values 85 and 170. It's similar in behavior to a linear feedback shift register in that it gives a shuffled-like ordering and has a near maximum period for its bit size. If you take any 8-bit value and you XOR it with every distinct 8-bit value, you'll get all 256 distinct 8-bit values just usually in a different order than what you XOR it with. And this is also true if you start with 254 of the possible 256 8-bit values as we have here, since this progression of states is missing 85 and 170, it's only 254 of them. This means if you were to XOR these pseudo-random states with the frame incrementer value in a systematic way and make a results histogram, you get a perfectly uniform distribution, which is something you want from a pseudo-random function. It means that in practice, this approach can fill in those two state gaps and create nice uniformity. Okay, so that's how the pseudo-random number generator in this game works. So going back. We can see there's a couple of conditions that keep black holes from being created. And this makes sense because a black hole doesn't immediately appear right after the previous one disappeared. So let's take this AND and change that to binary display. Okay, so this will branch if not zero, meaning not equal. And since there's three zeros in this AND mask, that means there's two to the third or eight possible ways to get a zero after applying it. So let me make a comment here and say So you can see the numbers that will satisfy this. The frame incrementer monotonically increases, showing passage of time, and this AND before the comparison concentrates the possible black hole creation periods into two bunched up time ranges across these incrementer values. So that breaks up what would otherwise be a more uniform chance over time of starting a black hole.
And since there's eight ways of satisfying this, that's a 96.9% chance of skipping that. Uh, and then there's more logic that skips black hole creation here. Uh, first of all, it's going to update the random state and get a new random number. Let's make this binary. Okay. And basically this means there's going to be a 75% chance to skip this logic based on the random pseudo random number because it will um, go to the end. I guess we could change this guess to um, the end of black hole logic because we know that's what it is now. Get rid of the guess. Okay. And now we're on those three calls to the random state. Again, maybe this is when the cyborgs told us the fabled multiple of three. Maybe that's what it means. I don't know. So let's look here. Looking down a bit, uh, this random number is going to get transferred into the Y. And that is going to be saved into the current black hole location. So let's rename 1D4B to be set new black hole location. Okay, so this is like rolling a die three times before reading the dice value. I'm not sure what the point is of that. Okay, we got some more selection logic here. This and uh, I'm going to make this base 10. Sorry, I'm going to make that binary. Okay. That gets the random 8-bit value down to a random 5-bit value. So now it is ranging from 0 to 31. And then it compares this to, this is the one I want to make base 10. It compares this to the number 25 which, since we're likely dealing with tile selection, should remind us immediately that there are 25 tiles. So the BCC beneath that is going to branch if the number is between 0 and 24. So let's make this 25 a constant. Since we haven't done a label yet for a constant, we've only made labels for memory addresses. So we can go to Edit, Project Properties, say uh, Project Symbols, uh, New Symbol, we'll make it a constant. We'll call this number of tiles. Value is going to be 25. And then click OK. And now we'll use it here. There we go. We hadn't done that yet. So if the branch of carry clear isn't taken, that means the value is from 25 to 31. And we're going to have to somehow make that a legit tile number. It's normal to have a random bit size that doesn't exactly match the range we want, and when that happens, the usual approach is just to ask for another random number until it's within range. But that's not what the programmer did. So let's keep reading the code. And make this binary. Okay. We can think of this and mask as a modulus instruction. What do we mean by that? Um, when dividing, sometimes we care about the most significant bits in a byte, and sometimes we care about the least significant bits. Shifting right, as you hopefully know, is dividing by powers of two, and those high bits that remain after that are the quotient. Uh, but in this case, we mask off the higher bits to leave only the lower bits, and those lower bits are the remainder after some power of two division. So, for example, in this case, leaving just the two rightmost bits with an AND mask is equivalent to mod 4, meaning the integer remainder after a division by 4. So let me make a comment of what how this will behave. Edit long comment. So that's what these extra numbers, the slop at the end of our random range, will turn into. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. So those are legitimate tile numbers now. 
but they don't stay that way. They become an offset for grabbing new tile numbers from a lookup table. See, we put it into Y, and now we're doing a lookup on that. So let's go look at this lookup table. Uh, it's cross-referenced between two places, one of which we just came from, of course. Uh, we're treating the size as if it's four, because we had a mod four. But the next label, cross-reference, makes it look like this table size could actually be five. So let's look at these in base 10. Okay, so 0, 4, 20, and 24 are all corners on the board, and 12 is the center. So let's rename this to cor whoops. corners and center, and navigate back to go where we were. So there it's labeled there. So when the tile selection is above 24, it'll get mapped to one of the corners instead meaning the corners are somewhat more likely to be selected by a black hole, and this matches my empirical experience of gameplay. Here's a visual summary of what we've discovered so far. The pseudorandom number is from the state XORD with the incrementer from the frame counter. Um, that's going to return a number. We get it down to 0 to 31, and if the tile number is above 24, then we remap according to this table right here. The black hole tile odds are mostly uniform, except the bottom right-hand corner is twice as likely, and the three other corners are three times as likely. That could be another possible multiples of three reference, but that's starting to seem a little far-fetched. So I think we got this figured out. Let's make sure we're done with the tile selection logic. Here, this is the current black hole location, so let's just double-click that, check for cross-references. Yeah, it only has a read and a write, and we've already seen what leads up to setting that black hole location, the write. So we can be pretty confident that we've seen the only setter, and we know how that selection was made for that setter. So we're done seeing how it's selected. That means we can ignore all the remaining black hole logic here. Um, well, let me take a look. Yeah, it's just loading the total number of human and AI players here. Uh, there is a loop with this BPL. The DEX makes that loop a zero-based index. That makes sense because if a black hole appears under a player, they get moved over into their little penalty box for a bit, so the code might have to loop over each player to check for that. That said, uh, let's use a non-unique local symbol for this player check loop since we haven't used one of those yet. So I'm going to double-click this, and this time I'm going to use non-unique local, and I'm just going to call it loop, a real common name we might want to reuse, right? And as you can see, it added an at symbol to the label, which is how many assemblers show the symbol is local, meaning it goes out of scope with any reference to it if there's a global symbol in between it and its next reference. So you can reuse this label loop anytime you want to label a tight loop in the code, and you don't have to name each one differently. We've seen all the black hole selection logic now, so the idea that a player could figure out the black hole pattern with that multiples of three clue in the instruction manual to me seems pretty far-fetched. However, it's even more difficult for a human to predict that than what we've shown so far, and that's because a pseudo-random state gets updated by more than just the black hole selection logic. Let's look at that. So that's our pseudo-random function. So there are one, There are 17 distinct calls that update the pseudo-random state and return a pseudo-random value. Only four of them were in the black hole logic, the first one deciding whether to do a black hole or not, and then the group of three calls that update the state three times in a row before grabbing a pseudo-random tile number. The rest are used in other randomness in the game. Any number of these calls could be used in loops themselves, meaning they could represent many updates to the pseudo-random state per frame. And we've already seen an example of random being used to decide if more random should be requested, so it's almost certain that there'll be a variable number of advances in the black hole state before the next black hole tile number is chosen. And there could be many such frames like this before a new black hole is even formed. 
So let's go see this in action. We saw earlier that the interrupt entry point for each frame was 1400, and I just hit a breakpoint I put there after it updates the frame incrementer. I'm going to open some new views now. Let's open up the PC breakpoints where we can see that breakpoint I created. Let's open the counters. That's going to let us know uh, what cycle we're on. And lastly, I'm going to open up the debug events history. So I just hit this breakpoint. Let's put a comment here saying, this is near the start of the frame. And now we can clear this breakpoint by toggling it here, or we can actually do that from this breakpoints window as well. Let's add a breakpoint to 1D41. This is right after the black hole tile gets selected. So you can see that group of three calls we had discussed. So let's put it here. And I'm gonna press F11 to reach that breakpoint there. And then the event history will call this black hole tile selected. I don't know why there's characters here sometimes. Sometimes they're question marks and such. Uh, I don't know why they appear. I think it's a bug. We'll just ignore it. So after these three random state updates. The random state, uh, which is held in 21, is uh, hex 25, which is a decimal 37. And we could see in the accumulator that the current tile number here is uh, 1D, that's 29, that's out of range. So let's watch that get corrected. We do the comparison, we see that we need to fix it. It's greater than 24. We convert it into a table lookup, and now that is hex 14, which is 16 plus 4, which is 20, which means it's going to be the lower left tile here that gets selected and becomes a black hole. And as I mentioned earlier, even if the black hole creation routine were finished, you'd still not see it on the emulation screen because it's going to take more cycles for that raster beam to get a chance to draw the update. However, Retro Debugger allows us to move forward or backward a frame. So let's move forward a frame and choose forward one frame. And now we can see the tile is gone. So in case that was too quick to follow, here's a visual summary of that tile selection. So by using this debug events history view, we're going to be able to log all the times the random state was advanced in this particular frame prior to processing the black hole, which gives an indication of how difficult it'd be to predict the black hole location if it wasn't difficult enough already. So we're going to put a breakpoint on the game's PRNG. Let's clear this last one. And to go to 358F. I didn't mean to make this other breakpoint. Let's put one here. And so now every time we press F11, it's going to stop on the pseudo random number generator. Uh, you can see here by the counters what our current cycle is. In the debug event history, we can do a single click up here on the first breakpoint, and that's going to roll back the emulation time to the cycle number shown here, which I'll click now. You can see it updated. That's a very powerful debugging tool just to go back to these points in time. And you can see that hex number 21, um, sorry, 21, which is our pseudo random number state, is now hex 78, which is decimal 120. Uh, this is many states before the 37 we just saw before um, when we selected the tile. Let's figure out how many. I'm going to keep pressing F11 to determine this until we hit that future cycle stamped breakpoint that we gave a name to. Again, I don't know what these auto-filled names are, I think it's a bug. I'm gonna make this bigger. Wait, did we pass it? No, not yet. There, we passed it. Assembly press control to set breakpoint. Wow, there's some memory leaking through here. That's weird. Okay, but we passed that breakpoint. 
and if we count all this, it was 33 times the pseudorandom number generator was called in this frame. So I took the time to examine all the calls to that updater. I won't share all that reversing, but here's a quick summary of what happened on the frame we stepped through. On the left is the screen during this frame, and on the right is a display of a frame later when the gameplay changes have been drawn. The pseudorandom state started at 120. So first off, the game code gets a pseudorandom value, and it's masked to create a 50-50 chance of doing a new star blink effect, and it decided to do this effect. So it goes on to select a random star to temporarily turn off. It does this by getting a random number to select the page for the high byte of the text screen position, and getting another random number for the 8-bit low byte of the position. And then it increments from the starting screen position until it runs into a star character to turn off. When a player moves, there's a dissolve effect. Random values are generated and logically anded with the sprite's bytes to turn off bits. You'll see fewer pixels if the teleport is towards the end of disappearing or towards the beginning of reappearing. This effect is achieved by getting yet another random value and turning off even more pixels in that sprite line. Eight sprite lines of the green warrior in the power pyramid, that's what I've been calling the penalty box, were updated twice in this way for a total of 16 random state updates. However, it looks like during this frame it only updated transparent pixels, so there's not a visual a difference between the two frames. The yellow warrior is also moving, and also had eight sprite lines modified this frame. Uh, each was only modified once for a total of eight more updates to the random state. Next, the random state is updated by the AI deciding whether it should turn off shields for any of its controlled characters. There's a 99% chance of skipping this logic, which it did. The AI then updates the random state again to decide if any of the AI characters should decide to move or fire. There's a 94% chance of skipping this logic, and it skipped it. And finally, we're at the black hole logic that we stepped through, where a random number was obtained to decide whether to make a new black hole. Since it decided to make one, the state was updated three times in a row before getting the tile number out of it, which is probably what the multiples of three hint was, if you can call that a hint. So, clearly, it's hard to know what the random state is going to be by the time the game decides to choose a new black hole position. So that's how the black holes work. In my opinion, there's almost no way a person just playing the game would have ever figured out this black hole pattern. As I mentioned well over an hour ago, the Commodore 64 version is a port of the earlier Atari 8-bit game. While the Atari instruction manual has the exact same multiples of three hint that's found in the Commodore 64 manual, it could be that the Atari is running different code, one that would make the hint in the instructions more fair. I'm assuming the Atari version works the same way, but I have not checked this. If anyone wants to track this down, the Retro Debugger is specifically designed to support Atari 8-bit, and 6502 Bench will also happily reverse Atari 8-bit code as well. If somebody finds important black hole differences in the two code bases, please let me know, or better yet, uh, post a response or a response video. But without that comparison, I'm demoting the multiples of three from hint status to merely red herring flavor text. Am I the first to investigate this? Probably. As Annie Dillard once said, the secret is not to write about what you love best, but about what you alone love at all. However, it made a great excuse to potentially introduce viewers to Retro Debugger and 6502 Bench, and I hope if you haven't tried them yet, you'll take them for a spin. I've got the basics down, but I still have much to learn. Retro Debugger has a lot of data views that look really cool, but I haven't taken the time to play with or understand all of them yet. There's a lot more for me to explore. And while 6502 Bench is great with code relocations, I'm not sure how to handle or represent ranges of code manipulations. For example, when I was starting from the uncracked Silicon Warrior G64 image, I hit an XOR deobfuscation loop. These are super common. In my Ghidra tutorial video, I showed how to handle these on Commodore games by using Ghidra's Jython scripts or by using Ghidra's emulation, which just lets the C64 code deobfuscate itself in the disassembler editor. But I'm not sure what to do in this case in 6502 Bench. Maybe keep redumping the code after bypassing each deobfuscation section of Vice. That sounds tedious. If there's some better practice here, please leave a comment. Lastly, if you are a 6502 toolmaker, please consider contributing new features to Retro Debugger and 6502 Bench. They're both open source. Okay, that's all there is for this one. Thank you so much for watching.